Chapter forty three of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, South America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, South America, by Frank Carpenter. Chapter forty three Venezuela and its Capital. Shortly after leaving the delta of the Orinoco, we reach the island of Trinidad where we stay but a few hours, and then take ship for the ports of Venezuela. We travel from one place to another, making excursions back into the country, visiting all the large cities, and spending some weeks in Caracas, the capital. Venezuela is a very large country. We see that it has vast tracts of rich land, and realize that it is one of the best of the South American republics. Its territory is so large that if it could be transported to the United States it would cover all Colorado, Texas, Idaho, and California. It is greater in extent than Germany and France combined, and large parts of it have excellent soil. We have already seen the rich pastures of the South. There are few countries of the world which are so well watered. We know something of the Orinoco system. Venezuela has many other navigable rivers. It has, all told, more than one thousand streams. Upon its coast there are thirty-two harbors and numerous bays. The largest bay is Lake Maracaibo the area of which is about the size of our Great Salt Lake. It was from Lake Maracaibo that Venezuela got its name. When the Spaniards discovered the country about eight years after Columbus first came to America, they entered this bay. On some of its shores and islands they found a tribe of natives living in huts made of palm leaves and rushes, built upon piles which they had driven down into the sand. Their huts were surrounded on all sides by water, and they went from one place to another in canoes. This reminded the Spaniards of Venice, so they called the country Venezuela, a word which means Little Venice, and by this name it has gone ever since. There is a similar town on Maracaibo today. The Indians inhabiting it live by fishing. They are quite savage, and although they speak Spanish, they have not united with the whites, as have many other tribes of the country. Venezuela is also a land of mountains. Branches of the Andes extend out into it, and we find the capital situated a little back from the seacoast in a nest in the mountains. Many of the mountains contain deposits of gold and other valuable minerals. There are rich gold mines south of the Orinoco, and among them one which has produced more than a million dollars worth of gold in a year. It is said to be the second richest gold mine of the world. The chief wealth, however, of Venezuela is in its soil. We have already seen the great pastures, the llanos of the Orinoco Basin. These are in the north and northwest vast tracts of rich land which produce great quantities of fine tobacco, cotton, and coffee. The coffee plantations are especially interesting. The climate here is warmer than in the coffee lands of southern Brazil, and we find that the trees are raised differently. The most of the fields are irrigated. The coffee trees are shaded to protect them from the sun. The young sprouts are set up among banana plants. The bananas shoot up quickly, and their wide green leaves ward off the rays of the sun from the tender coffee trees and keep the soil moist. Later, bucuara trees are planted. These trees grow rapidly and soon extend high above the coffee plants, sending out branches like those of the sycamore and furnishing just the right shade. The coffee produced in Venezuela is of a very good quality. It is much like mocha coffee, and much of it is sold as mocha in our market. Along the coast of Venezuela we see many cocoa orchards, and learn that they produce a very fine chocolate. The trees are carefully cultivated, the orchards being laid out much the same as our peach orchards, save that the trees are protected from the sun in the same way as the coffee trees are. The orchards are also irrigated. The weeds are kept down, and the fruit is more carefully cared for than that of the orchards we saw on the Amazon. The result is that the trees produce large quantities of fruit, six or seven hundred pounds of chocolate seeds being grown in a year on one acre. Many orchards produce two crops a year. After the seeds are taken out of the pulp and dried, they are carried to the seaports, and thence shipped to the markets. The most of the product goes to Spain, France, and Germany, but some is sent to the United States. The cocoa seeds are bought by the fanega, a measure holding about a bushel and a half. As much as twenty million pounds have been exported in one year, and for this the people have received about two million dollars. Caracas is one of the most interesting of the South American capitals. 
it is the chief city of venezuela and although its population is less than one hundred thousand it is about three times as large as any other town in venezuela caracas is situated in a little basin on the southern slope of the mountains only six miles in a straight line back from the coast still it is more than half a mile up in the air and in travelling to it on the railroad we have to go more than twenty-two miles we ride through banana fields and palm groves then climb the mountains now turning this way now that now we go over bridges with gorges below us which are many hundred feet deep and now we shoot through tunnels to come out again on the side of the mountain with the vast expanse of the caribbean sea spread out under our eyes the air grows cooler the yellow fever-laden tropical atmosphere of the coast has disappeared and when at last we land in caracas we are in one of the most healthful climates of the world the city lies in a beautiful valley about two miles wide and fifteen miles long surrounded by mountains some of which are two miles in height the valley is covered with sugar plantations vegetable gardens coffee groves and orchards of oranges lemons and other fruit we are surprised at the city the streets are narrow but the sidewalks are made of portland cement and the bright buildings facing them are of all colors of the rainbow they are nearly all of one story and have ridge roofs of red tile Many of them have windows facing the street, heavily barred, and through the bars we see pretty Spanish women looking out. The streets cross one another at right angles with a number of plazas or parks. In one of the parks there is a bronze statue of George Washington, and in another a statue of Simon Bolivar, the hero of Venezuela, and in fact of all South America. He was the Washington of this part of the world. He organized a movement which resulted in the independence of Venezuela, New Granada or Colombia, and peru and he was the founder of bolivia later on we visit the caracas university we spend some time in the federal palace and in the houses of congress where we learn that the country is governed in much the same way as our own at night we go about the streets under the rays of electric lights we ride from one part of the city to another on street railways and notice that caracas has many of the modern improvements many of the young venezuelans we meet speak english and french and we see that the better classes of the people live as comfortably as we do at home some of them have large one-story houses composed of many rooms encircling courts or patios in which grow great rose trees curious varieties of palms and all sorts of tropical plants the venezuelans are very hospitable they pride themselves upon being one of the most enterprising peoples of the south american continent and think their country is destined to be the greatest among those of the southern half of our hemisphere they are more interested in the united states than the other south americans a large part of their trade is with us and there are fast steamships which start every few days from la guayra to new york the journey takes not much more than a week and as we stand on the wharf and look at the ships flying the american flag we feel inclined to jump on board and go home there is however another country left to visit we have the guianas yet to explore so we take one of the little steamers which is going east along the coast and by changing again at the island of trinidad get a ship bound for georgetown the capital of british guiana End of chapter forty three chapter forty four of carpenter's geographical reader south america this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, South America by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 44. In the Guianas. The Guianas are different from the other countries of South America, in that they are colonies belonging to nations of europe british guiana belongs to great britain dutch guiana is a dependency of holland and french guiana is the property of france all of these countries have governors appointed by the rulers of the countries to which they belong none of them have large populations and as a whole they are of little importance in the commerce and trade of the south american continent still when south america was discovered this region was thought to be one of the richest of all it was a part of a country described by the explorers as full of gold silver and precious stones one adventurer who skirted the guianas and entered the orinoco told about a city called el dorado 
which had been built in the midst of a great white lake whose smallest house surpassed in grandeur the palaces of the incas and the aztecs in this city said the explorer the vessels used in the kitchens are of gold and silver studded with diamonds the houses have statues of solid gold as big as giants and there are figures of beasts birds fish and trees all of gold the pleasure gardens of the islands are filled with figures of gold and silver and the king of the country and his court wear clothes of such a nature that they seem to be sprinkled with gold and silver from sandal to crown the descriptions of this wonderful city excited all europe and expeditions were formed to explore this part of the world great numbers of young men left europe for this purpose expecting to make fortunes and in looking for the fabulous city they explored the greater part of northern south america penetrating to the sources of the orinoco entering the amazon and the rivers which flow out into the atlantic through the guianas it was from the expedition led or sent by sir walter raleigh that great britain became possessed of british guiana and it was said that sir walter raleigh presented to queen elizabeth some gold nuggets and rude images of solid gold as an evidence of the value of his discovery gold really exists along the orinoco the essequibo and in some of the streams of french and dutch guiana it has not been discovered in the guianas however in very large quantities and the wonderful city of el dorado with its gold and diamond kitchen utensils is yet to be found the land of the guianas is of a curious formation it is a body of highlands sloping down at its outer edges toward the basin of the orinoco and that of the amazon in such a way that if the country were dropped down a few hundred feet of water of the sea would rush in and the guianas would be a large island the exact extent of the territory is not known french guiana claims a part of brazil and british guiana has for a long time contended that much of venezuela should rightly belong to it at the lowest estimate however each of the three countries is as large as the state of new york and they all contain some excellent land the climate of most parts is very unhealthful it is exceedingly hot and the highlands are covered with forests as dense as the wildest parts of the amazon here and there are great grassy plains upon which cattle might be fed and upon the low lands near the coast are many places which grow sugar coffee and cotton but what kind of people are there in these countries we shall see the civilized population of the coast cities the majority of the inhabitants however live in the wilds they are savage indians and savage negroes the descendants of runaway slaves the indians are of many tribes and they have very strange customs the arawaks according to report have a game called the whip dance in which the dancers stand in two rows opposite each other each one has a whip with a hard strong lash made of fiber with these they whip the naked calves of each other's legs often thrashing each other until their legs are covered with blood the dance is looked upon as a test of endurance and bravery and the man who can stand the most whipping is considered the best the game goes on it is said with perfect good temper and at its close the dancers go off in a band and drink one another's health the people of another tribe of indians wear nothing but a strip of cloth about their waists they are however fond of jewelry and pierce their lower lips in such a way that two pins can be worn in them they also have pins in their nostrils and deck their necks and arms with such beads and coins as they can pick up the indians are of many tribes some of them paint their bodies wear bits of bone in their lips and cause their calves to swell by means of garters tightly clasped below the knee there are other strange indians who are said to have light complexions with blue eyes and light beards and rumor gives it that there is a fairy race in these regions which all other indians dread most of these reports come from hearsay and some of them like the story of the gold city of el dorado may not be true we have not the time required to make such explorations ourselves and so shall leave the exact nature of the indians in doubt saying we suppose that they may be as reported 
but we really do not know. There is no doubt, however, about there being many black people in the Guianas. We shall see civilized Negroes everywhere. Slaves were imported for generations to work on the sugar plantations and to get the fine woods out of the forests and put them on the ships for Europe. After slavery was abolished, many of the Negroes settled on the coast islands where they had been toiling. We see their thatched huts everywhere. They are now farmers. Other Negroes went off to the woods and formed tribes of bush Negroes, intermarrying with the Indians. The bush Negroes have a language which is a mixture of Dutch, French, and English, combined with Indian and African words. Some of the wild Negroes are very brave many being strong and fine-looking. But here we are at the wharf of Georgetown. We have sailed up a little river, the banks of which are lined with tropical vegetation, with sugar estates cut out of the jungle. We see many coconut palms, clumps of bamboos, and great trees covered with flowers. What a queer crowd is that on the wharf! We rub our eyes and wonder if we are not in Asia rather than in South America. There are scores of almond-eyed Chinese with their hair hanging in long tails down their backs. There are black Hindus in turbans and strange garments, and there are Parsis wearing long black coats and hats like inverted coal scuttles. There are numerous Portuguese and English merchants who have come to the steamer. Most of the Hindus and Chinese were imported to work on the sugar plantations, and we find them scattered everywhere throughout the coast countries. How queer Georgetown looks after our long stay in the Spanish and Portuguese cities of other parts of the continent. It is more like a city of Holland than Spain. The roofs are slanting and the walls of most of the houses are of wood or galvanized iron. Many of the houses are tall, built with gable ends facing the street. Near every house is a great iron tank. This is to catch the rainwater which is used for drinking for it is better than that which comes from the springs near the city. Georgetown has about 50,000 inhabitants, and it has some large buildings. The city lies on low land, and the large buildings stand upon wooden piles which have been driven down into the mud to form the foundations. In many of the streets run canals, which serve to drain the water out into the river in times of flood. The city has many modern improvements. We enjoy visiting the stores, for the merchants speak English, and we take the tramway and ride out to the suburbs, where the houses stand by themselves in beautiful gardens filled with tropical plants. The sugar plantations are interesting. Many of them are large, employing hundreds of laborers and making thousands of tons of sugar each season. Each has its manager and overseers, and books are kept as carefully as those of our great business establishments. The land of the Guiana coast is so rich that the sugar cane can be cut several times a year, and it is said that it will grow up for sixty years in succession without being replanted. The soil is composed of earth washings brought down by the rivers from the mountains, soil so rich that it will grow everything produced in the tropics. Great quantities of dirt are brought during the floods, which are so great that dikes have to be erected to keep the land from washing into the sea. The building of these dikes is very expensive, and so the sugar plantations are nearly all owned by men and companies having large capital. We find more sugar plantations near Paramaribo, the capital of Dutch Guiana, which we reach in a little Dutch ship from Georgetown. Paramaribo lies about 20 miles up the Suriname River. It has about 30,000 inhabitants, and in its architecture and the waterways and houses, it is not unlike the cities of Holland. Many of the people speak Dutch, a language which sounds very queer to us when it comes from the Negroes we see everywhere. There are also many whites and mulattoes. There are also black-skinned Javanese who have come to work in the sugar plantations. The better classes are dressed in light clothes and women wearing stiff skirts, loose jackets and headdresses not unlike turbans. The poorer people go barefooted, and many of the children wear no clothing whatever. From Paramaribo we steam to Cayenne, the capital of French Guiana. 
the city is smaller than either georgetown or paramaribo it contains about twelve thousand inhabitants but it looks quite large from the ship with a grove of palm trees behind it and a high church steeple rising above the rest of the houses it is built upon an island about thirty miles in circumference a narrow strait separating it from the mainland we find the town interesting the most of its houses are of two stories some of them being covered with plaster which is painted all colors of the rainbow the land is not much different from that of the other guianas and the people are much the same we see however many hard faces among them french guiana has for years been a penal colony to which thieves and other criminals have been exported from france its climate is not healthful and it is indeed not a place where any traveller would care to stay long we are glad when the steamer arrives on which we can go back to trinidad island and thence having finished our long tour of the south american continent we take ship for new york end of chapter forty four end of carpenter's geographical readers south america by frank carpenter